Okay, welcome back to the deep dive. Good to be here. Today we're focusing in on fluorindafinil, uh, sometimes called CRL 40,940. That's the one. Yeah, CRL 40,940 or bisfluoromodafinil. It's a research chemical that's getting some attention. Right, the main reason seems to be its potential for, well, sharpening focus, increasing wakefulness, giving a cognitive boost. Exactly. Initial research looked at it for conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome, narcolepsy, even some aspects of ADHD and Alzheimer's disease research. Okay, so clinical research angles. Yes, but beyond that, it's also popped up on the radar as you know a nootropic for people just looking for that cognitive edge. But definitely still in the research phase, we should stress that. Oh, absolutely. Hmm. Research chemical status means there are inherent uncertainties. Okay, let's get into the how. How does fluoromaphenol actually work? What's the mechanism believed to be? Well, the science points towards it being a selective, atypical dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Okay, dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Can you break that down a little? Sure. Basically, it seems to increase the levels of available dopamine, specifically in a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens shell. And that area is linked to reward motivation. Yeah. That kind of thing. Precisely. So that boost in dopamine there is likely what's driving those effects on wakefulness and focus. We hear about dopamine with other compounds too. Yeah. How does this one, flomodafinil, stack up against, say, the more well-known modafinil? Yeah, good question. Studies suggest the overall effects are pretty similar, especially for wakefulness. Similar. Okay. But some research hints that flomodafinil might actually last longer. Its action might be more sustained. Hmm, longer lasting. Which, if true, could potentially mean you could achieve similar results with a maybe a lower daily dose compared to standard modafinil doses. Interesting. But if it keeps you awake longer, mm -hmm. what about sleep? Does it mess with your sleep patterns more? That's always a concern. That's a really critical point. And interestingly, there was a study looking at this. It suggested flomodafinil might actually disturb sleep architecture less than modafinil does. Less, how so? They saw um, less impact on slow wave activity, deep sleep on the EEG readings. So potentially better daytime alertness without wrecking your night's sleep quite as much. Potentially, yes. That could be a significant advantage. But you know, it's one study. More research is definitely needed to confirm that. Right. Okay, so what about the downsides? What are the common side effects people might run into? You're likely looking at side effects similar to modafinil. Things like uh, insomnia, that's a big one. Headaches, maybe some anxiety, and then GI issues. GI like nausea. Yeah, nausea, maybe diarrhea or constipation, gas, heartburn, sometimes decreased appetite. Pretty standard stuff for stimulants. Although I've heard some anecdotal reports suggesting maybe fewer headaches or less anxiety with full modafinil compared to modafinil. Yes, some users do report that. But it's really important to emphasize that individual responses can vary a lot. What one person experiences, another might not at all. Fair enough. What about more serious, uh, less common reactions? Again, mirroring the risks with modafinil, there's a potential for severe allergic reactions. Like rashes. Yeah, skin rashes, itching, hives, but also potentially difficulty breathing or swelling angioedema. And there's also the risk, though rare, of really serious skin reactions like Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Wow, okay. Those sound serious. They are. They need immediate medical attention if anything like that happens. It's rare, but the risk is there. Given how it works on the brain, any worries about it interacting with other drugs? Absolutely. That's a major consideration. Potential interactions are definitely a concern, especially with things like blood thinners. Okay. Also antidepressants, certain antifungal meds, anti-seizure medications, even anti-anxiety drugs. It's a fairly broad list. So basically, if you're on any prescription medication mm -hmm. or have any health conditions, Extreme caution is needed. Really, you absolutely need to talk to a healthcare professional before even considering something like this. Right. Okay, let's shift gears to availability and cost. Can you even get this stuff easily? And what does it cost? Well, it's not FDA approved for medical use. So you're primarily finding it through online vendors that sell research chemicals or nootropic. Research purposes only, right? That's how it's typically marketed, yes. In terms of cost, looking online, you might see, say, around $55 for maybe 20 capsules of 50 milligrams. Double that quantity, maybe closer to $100. Like powder form. Powder is often available too, yeah. Maybe around $50, give or take, for a gram. But these prices can fluctuate quite a bit. 
And it's not something insurance would cover, obviously. No, definitely not. It's entirely out of pocket. And its legal status can vary too. While it might be purchasable for research in places like the US, specific state laws could differ. Got it. How quickly does it kick in? If someone takes it, when would they likely feel the effects? Based on user reports and what we know about modafinil's kinetics, you're probably looking at effects becoming noticeable within, say, 30 to 60 minutes. Pretty standard onset then. Generally, yes. Though some studies have hinted maybe a slightly slower or onset compared to modafinil for flumodafinil, so, you know, expect something within the hour, but individual timing can vary. And the big question with any research chemical, yeah. what about long-term safety? That is the crucial point, isn't it? Because it is a research chemical, there just isn't solid long-term safety data established. We don't have years of widespread use and tracking like we do for approved medications. Unlike modafinil itself, which is generally considered safer for long-term prescribed use. Exactly. Modafinil has a much more established track record when used appropriately under medical supervision. With clomalcinol, there are still many unknowns long term. So what's the advice then, given that uncertainty? Well, the general recommendation you see is cautious, infrequent use, maybe only two or three times a week, definitely not daily, and hmm. taking regular breaks. To minimize potential risks, including habit forming potential. Right. Its mechanism involves dopamine, so there is a theoretical risk of misuse or dependence, similar to why modafinil is a Schedule IV substance. Caution is key. What are the absolute worst-case scenarios, the most severe potential outcomes someone really needs to be aware of? Okay, worst case, you're looking at those severe allergic reactions we mentioned, angioedema, hypersensitivity, right. really dangerous. And the skin reactions. Yes, Stevens-Johnson syndrome is a major, potentially life-threatening concern. Also, because of the dopamine effects, dependence is a risk, especially with frequent or high-dose use. And the fact it's a research chemical means? Means there could be other unforeseen long-term risks we just don't know about yet. And misuse or taking too much could lead to overdose symptoms, things like severe insomnia, restlessness, agitation, chest pain, nausea, confusion. So definitely not something to experiment with lately. Absolutely not, and it should be stated clearly. Pregnant or breastfeeding individuals, anyone under 18, they should avoid it completely. And mixing it with other substances is highly advised against. Okay. Lastly, let's talk dosage. What kind of ranges are typically discussed? Well, again, this is based on research discussions and user reports, not medical guidelines. Starting doses are usually suggested to be very low. Like how low? Maybe in the 12.5 to 25 milligram range per day just to assess tolerance. And then intermediate doses. Often seem to fall between 50 and 100 milligrams. Some consider that range roughly comparable in effect to maybe a 200 milligram dose of modafinil. And higher doses. Generally discouraged. Going over 150 milligrams seems to significantly increase the risk of side effects, especially insomnia. It can become counterproductive. Is there any talk of microdosing? Yes, that concept comes up too. People taking very small amounts, maybe three milligrams, up to 25 milligrams, perhaps a few times a week, hoping for subtle cognitive benefits with minimal side effects. But again, that's very exploratory. So wrapping this all up, what's the main takeaway message for someone hearing about flomodafinil? I think the core message is this. Yes, flomodafinil shows potential for wakefulness and cognitive enhancement. That's why it's interesting, but. Big but. Huge but. Its research chemical status means there are significant unknowns and uncertainties. We lack comprehensive long-term safety data. And the potential risks, even the rare ones, are yeah. serious. Very serious. They absolutely have to be weighed carefully. So caution seems to be the operative word here. Definitely. A very measured approach. If someone were to consider it, starting with the absolute lowest dose possible is essential. And checking with the doctor first. Crucial. Especially, as we said, if you're on any other medications or have any underlying health conditions. A conversation with a qualified healthcare provider is non-negotiable, really. So while that promise of a sharper mind is always appealing, this really highlights the need to balance that desire against the very real and sometimes unknown risks involved with compounds like this. Absolutely. It's a reminder to respect our own biology and proceed with extreme care when exploring the frontiers of cognitive enhancement, especially outside established medical frameworks.